Welcome to One Insight. My name is Rich Litvin. I grew up in London and I now live in LA. And this is a podcast for extraordinary top performers. You see, I've coached some of the most successful and talented people on the planet. I see what most people cannot see, and I dare to say what most people wouldn't dare to say. And what I know about success is that on the other side of it, it can actually be lonely. You can feel like more of an imposter the more successful you become. And when you're the most interesting person in the room, you're actually in the wrong room. I coach around insight. Life looks one way, something happens, the world looks different, and your entire world changes. It can happen in an instant. And this podcast is called One Insight because a single insight can change everything. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us for this year's WBEX 2015 Summit event. Today, we have an incredible session planned for you. This year, for the full summit, we are doing things a little differently in that we want to really focus in on your practical application of the learning from the sessions. We want this to go beyond an interesting session and really help you to implement what you're learning here in your practice. Just like with the pre-summit, we encourage you to post your top learning, your questions, and your comments. Um, but for, uh, for your learning purposes, uh, not be passive about it, but actually implement your learning with your clients. And so the way that we have um, set this up for you is through an exclusive private LinkedIn group, and you can find this at wbex.com forward slash fully engaged. That's W-B-E-C-S dot com forward slash fully engaged. So let's go ahead and get today's session started. Rich Litvin is an expert at taking high achievers to the greatest levels of success. He has coached Olympic athletes, presidential candidates, Hollywood film directors, British special forces operatives, millionaires, and finance professionals managing over $100 billion of assets. His clients are by invitation and referral only. Rich leads a community of coaches who are the top 4% in their field. He is co-author of The Prosperous Coach and a member of the Association of Transformational Leaders. He is the founder of the Confident Woman Salon and the High Achieving Introvert Project. He has lived and worked in eight countries on four continents. Born in England, he still has an adorable British accent, I can attest to this, and spent his time between Los Angeles and London. Rich, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Kiva. Well, the accent's not so adorable if people are listening from Britain. I'll be sounding just like my, my colleagues over there. But thanks, thanks for the intro. Uh, I know you got tongue-tied over it, and, and me too. When I think back to the people I've worked with over the last few years, sometimes it, 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 it astounds me. The way I describe what I do these days, I say, if you're the kind of person who needs a coach, then I'm not for you. Because my clients are the kind of people who don't need a coach. They are extremely high performers. They're doing extraordinary things in their world. They, I've worked with presidential candidates, I've worked with Olympic athletes, and, and anything in between. And it's really fun for me to sit down with somebody from this place of not only coming from on the inside over here that I think they don't need help, but from knowing they don't need help. I think too often coaching is seen as remedial. It's like you show up when you have a problem. And even my clients, that I have to almost train them out of it. They'll, they'll show up and say, you know what, I'm, I'm good today. I haven't got a problem. There's no, I haven't got anything to talk about. Which always makes me smile because I'll say, that's great. We don't have to talk about a problem. We don't have to talk about a challenge. Let's see what else is going on in your life. Let's just have a conversation. Because from that place, it's surprising what can, get, what can actually be created. So let me give some context for today. We're calling the session Provocative Questions for High Performers. And in the background, I'll run some slides. There's some images from uh, the book I wrote for coaches. There's some quotes from the book. Um, they'll just run through in the background. Um, and, and the context I have for today is that everything you've done that's made you as successful as you are today is actually holding you back from your next level of success. 
everything you've done that's created the success you have today is holding you back from your next level of success. I'll give you a couple of examples of this, stories that, that, that uh, are, are close to me right now. I read an interview recently with Reid Hoffman. He's the co-founder of LinkedIn. He's an entrepreneur, venture capitalist. He's got a net worth of $4.7 billion. And the interviewer in the New York Times, uh, at the end of the interview, she, she noted that he said, I'm functioning at 60% capacity. But she didn't understand what it means to be a high performer. You see, she wrote, even the hyperkinetic Mr. Hoffman conceded that he could use a break, at least a small one. But that's what, that was not what he was saying. He's one of the most high-performing people on the planet, and he feels on the inside he's only performing and only functioning at 60% capacity. He wasn't craving a break. This was a clue to one of the secret thoughts deep down inside many high achievers. Because as a high achiever, your life and your achievements can appear brilliant to most people, do appear brilliant to most people in your world. And yet you have a sensation that deep down so much more is possible. So check in for yourself right now or think about your clients. How true is that for you? The people around you are astounded at what you create. But on the inside, it doesn't feel that difficult. It can often feel kind of easy. Gay Hendricks in his book, The Big Leap, talks about the zone of genius. And the problem when we work in our zone of genius is we're doing what feels so natural and so easy to us. We love it that we feel a bit of a fraud. We have this sensation that it doesn't matter how much acknowledgement we get from people. On the inside, we know that so much more is possible. One of my clients is a professor at an Ivy League school. All sorts of admiration from her peers, but despite that, what she told me is, I could do this with my eyes closed. I want something more. Another client is a woman with a multi-million dollar business. She's respected by everyone in her field, and she used exactly the same words. I could do this with my eyes closed. I want something more. And then she went on. I'm not lonely, but I'm very alone. There's no one else I dare share this with but you. It's one of the gifts you can give extraordinary high performers to create enough safety for a place where they can actually speak their truth. The challenge of being a high performer is you can be surrounded by people whose only mission is to say yes to you, whose only mission is to make you feel good or to say what they think you need to hear. And to be the kind of coach who creates enough safety that your clients can say what's truly going on for them. To be the kind of coach who's willing to hide nothing and hold nothing back is a very unique position for extraordinary high performers. So I was working once with a hedge fund manager. He had a multi-million dollar net worth and a network of friends who were world leaders. <laughs> yeah, none of that mattered to him. He had a secret fear that he shared with me, and he'd never shared it with another living soul. He literally would hung out with presidents. He went to Ivy League school. Um, deep down inside him, he felt like he didn't fit in. You see, what drove him and what also held him back at the same time was the shame that he felt that he grew up in a poor immigrant family. It was what drove him to higher and higher levels of success and what held him back at the same time. You see, we can never have enough of what we don't really need. We can never have enough of what we don't really need. And often, well, look, we're entrepreneurs, right? We're coaches, right? We, we wouldn't do this, get up every day and show up from a place of who can I serve if deep down inside something wasn't driving us. Another client I worked with was the person Kiva mentioned earlier. He was a British Special Forces operative. He'd done things that, that chilled me, that would scare most people. He knew how to experience deep fear. He, even in those moments of deep fear, he could still perform at an extraordinary level. Situations in places that would terrify most people. But by the time I was working with him, he was now a businessman. And here he was frozen, because he was finally at the limits of his ability in a completely different field. If you're a high achiever, if your clients are high achievers, 
the challenges you face are wrapped up in your gifts. You face what to most people would seem like high quality problems. And most people around you would dream of having your challenges. But for you, they're simply life. Now, today, I'm going to dive in. I'm actually going to coach somebody. I, I said I didn't want to teach today. But if I do teach, I teach by coaching. And so I want to bring on Kirsty Hanley. Kirsty's from the UK too, although I live in uh, LA these days. Kirsty still lives in the UK. She lives in London. Uh, I'll ask Kirsty to tell you a bit more about who she is professionally. I want to tell you who Kirsty is for me. Kirsty is an extraordinary high performer. She's a risk taker. She's willing to do things differently, to lean into her edge again and again and again. She's a mother. And, and I'm a dad these days to a one-year-old and a three-year-old, so I know from the other side what it takes to be a mother, but also to be a mother who's out there in the world creating and performing and building a business and being an entrepreneur and being a coach. And for me, Kirsty is a risk taker who's willing to keep challenging herself, to keep playing the game at higher and higher levels. So, Kirsty, that's who you are for me. Hi. Hi there. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, you, you really, you, you're somebody extraordinary, somebody I admire, and, and uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to play with you today and, and, and dive in deep. G give me a bit of context, like for people who don't know you, like, officially, what's your, your title and your bio? Who are you? So, um, so I'm Kirsty Hanley, and I'm a cognitive hypnotherapist and a coach, and I work um, from London. From I have a clinic in Harley Street in London, um, and over the, the past while, I've been moving more, much more and more into the coaching world, um, letting go a little bit of the, the therapy world. And, and let me get some context for this for myself. If I'm right, uh, cognitive hypnotherapy, that... that, that the world of therapy is, is a bit like the world of coaches. It's very overcrowded. Um, many people are struggling. There's many, many people in that world. It's not easy to be successful in that particular world. Just same as in coaching. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, I think um, in my uh, on my, the floor of my building, there's I think 25 cognitive hypnotherapists. We're quite different to, to regular hypnotherapists, and so yeah, within just a very very short geographical space, there's a lot of us. Um, and, wow. yeah. So I, I live in LA. I always, I always think you throw a stone out of a window, you hit half a dozen coaches. Yeah. Um, so in, in, in Harley Street, which is the place for, for medical professionals, uh, it's, it's cream of the crop are there in, in, the, in the UK, just in your building alone, 25 people with the exact same t official title as you have. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you become successful in that world? Because by the time I met you, you were already playing at a high level. Yeah, well, um, so I, uh, I, so I attended a school called the Quest Institute, which has really high quality of training. And so I came out, I think, already probably with an advantage over many people out there. Um, and I, I guess, you know, uh, we've had this conversation before, haven't we, about how I created the business. And to me, I kind of don't know <laughs> um, because I, I just really love what I do and I really made it happen because of that. Um, so I talked to everybody about what I was doing and, and I was really passionate about the level of change that people could experience through working with me. Um, so I think that is really key. Um, and also I have always um, not been unafraid, but I've kind of enjoyed the, the, the but it's not just the therapy, it's not just the coaching, it's the business of therapy, it's the business of coaching, which has never scared me. You know, I've kind of enjoyed getting to understand and getting to learn more about that as I've gone along. So let me pull, let me pull about, I want to see some, some distinctions in there I want, to, I want to draw out, because this is the zone of genius, right? The challenge with the zone of genius is when you do what you do and it seems so easy. So I hear a few things I heard. You went for the highest quality training you can do. And, and I think it's one of the one of the keys in, in coaching is that we're, we're willing to invest in our professional development. Uh, I wrote an article a, a year or so back called Mastery, How to Become an Overnight Success as a Coach in 46 Years. And and I think it's not only the professional development that we do now in our, in our field, but it's everything before then 
we, we, that's included. You know, I, I spent two years living in Botswana, teaching kids science in their third language in 1992. What that's helped me do is have an understanding of language and communication that I could never have got from a training course. Now, it's not that I'd say to anybody beginning coaching or starting a new career as a consultant, yeah, go and live in Africa for two years. But it is everything we've done before, and we don't always see that. We bring it with us. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And it's interesting, I, I, in my previous life, I would, um, was a stage manager. I went to drama school and I trained as a stage manager and then I worked in television production. And, um, and my father works in, in the theatre industry as well, or did before he retired. And I always remember him saying to me when I first trained as a stage manager, um, what's the question? The answer is yes. That's how you work in theatre. And that's really stayed with me, you know, and it's things like that. It's thing, it's, it is all of the, the combination of my skills and experience that kind of led me to be able to problem seek, I guess, and problem solve um, in ways that have really helped my business going forward and also in my relationship with my clients as well. You know. Well, I like it. I'm just, we're not coaching yet, hasn't begun yet. We're drawing a, getting a sense of your world and, and how you show up as a high performer. There's a distinction called say yes. It's, it's the first rule of improv. If you ever do improv comedy training, just say yes. Yeah. And, and getting that insight as a youngster stayed with you all this time. And, and yeah. what we're doing now is fleshing out some of your world so that when we do dive into the coaching, I have a sense of who you are and how you show up in the world. You, you said, I talk to everyone. Now, mm -hmm. me, I'm a bit of an introvert. That, that's, that's challenging. I, I can't talk to everyone. When I do talk to somebody, I go really deep, but, but I get a bit overwhelmed with that thought of talking to everyone. But there's something in you that that, that phrase really resonated. I felt it as you said it. Yeah, and it's interesting. You know, when, you, when I hear you say that back to me, I think, oh, do I talk to everyone? Because no, I'm, I sit somewhere in the middle of introvert, extrovert. And, um, and, um, but what it is, I think, is that I'm really i've always been very enthusiastic i've experienced personal change through doing this work um myself on a an amazing level and so i know when i speak to to somebody um what is possible and i get excited about that you know it's lovely talking to people and and being able to see that so much more is possible than they currently believe so i guess it's that excitement you know if, if i'm having a conversation with somebody then i'm able to um, you know, just gently, you know, I don't, I'm not overbear, overbearing, overbearing with it, bearing with it, but, you know, there's this thing that is available out there, and it's amazing, and it's magical, and, you know, if you check it out, it's, there's a lot that can happen. I, I went too far the other way in my early days of coaching, where I became a bit of a proselytizer, tried to convince everybody how amazing coaching was in the early days, learned quickly that was a bad idea, and it didn't work. Yeah, there's permission, right, but, but, yeah. Yeah, it's a balance. It's a balance. And with therapy, you know, it's, it's a real balance because, you know, most people don't want to talk about the deep stuff, you know, in public or, and that's not something that I ever encouraged people to do. But um, I guess it's more just kind of living the message, you know, it's more just kind of this gentle knowing that you can carry with you that there's this thing and, and yeah. And it's exciting. And I feel that as you speak, the gentle knowing, I get a sense of that inside of you. You just know. You've experienced it. You're passionate about change. You've experienced change. You know the gift it's been to you and the clients you've worked with. And I get that you have no doubts that it will be a gift to the people you spend time with in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. You said one other thing I wanted to pull out. You said, I, I was not unafraid, which if we take out the double negative means there were times <laughs> when you were afraid and you, you showed up anyway. And it's another thing I get about you. It, it, you're, not, you're not trying to get past fear. You're okay with fear. It's just part of the journey. Yeah. So, um, so I did this TED Talk last year, which was all about this, which was all about fear. And I used to be somebody who um, stayed well away. <laughs> you know, if I came up against something that, that frightened me, I just... I shut down and I pull back and um, and my journey has really been about how there are always fears there's always limiting beliefs and actually um, we can use those to as a sort of sing signal to move towards rather than stay away and that for me is something that 
um, has been growing over the years and is kind of the most exciting piece in the jigsaw really but yeah the, the things that, that maybe once would have held me back now become the reason for doing them. Isn't it interesting we took our three-year-old to swim class this week and on Monday he was really freaked out very scared it was very challenging for us to to know that it's going to be valuable for him by Tuesday he's a bit more relaxed yesterday he was jumping in the pool he asked to jump off the big rock and I was talking to him, he's only three, but I was saying to him, just notice that the things that we're scared of, often it's because we secretly want them. And when we do the things that we're scared of, we feel so amazing afterwards. And he got it because he's feeling amazing. He can't wait to go to swim class this afternoon. Yeah, I love that. That's absolutely wonderful. And it's, yeah, and it's, and it's, it can be you know, the first time that feels like it's going to be the most scary thing in the world and you do it and you don't die and then you can kind of do it again, you know, and just test the water and see. Um, and yeah, and then before you know it, you're, you're swimming and splashing around. I love that metaphor. That's great. So, so here's where we are, getting a sense of Kirsty as a high performer. Um, the world of cognitive hypnotherapy, you quickly rise up to be a, a real high performer in that world. Uh, just last year, you gave a TED talk. Then you became a coach. Uh, we began to know each other. You, you dived into this world of coaching. You, you perform at a high level with your clients. You, you've uh, just signed an extraordinary client you've begun working with, who I know is really energizing you. Yeah, lots has changed in the past uh, year, really, I guess, you know. Um, partly through circumstances. So I had some personal stuff that went on, my, you know, with my, my, my marriage broke up and I was kind of forced into a different way of working in the world and seeing things differently. Um, and I used it as an opportunity, which, um, which has been amazing. And yeah, I've, I've been really exploring, well, I, I, I've over a, a period of time now been exploring coaching much, much more. And um, over the past year, really kind of been moving my business towards um, taking on um, coaching clients a lot more. And it's a really exciting way of working. I, I really, really enjoy it. I love the journey um, that you can go on with someone through their stuff. You know, it's like whatever comes up, I have these amazing tools that we can work on. Um, you know, we, we can, can sort of dip into the therapeutic stuff if I need to. And we, I love sort of guiding people towards the creation, you know, towards what they can, what they can create for themselves. Um, and the exciting sort of things that that can bring. I hear another distinction in the middle of what you're saying. You use adversity as opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is a very strong belief of mine that you find the power of who you can be through your adversity. So to really embrace those experiences, and it can be hard, you know, it's not, doesn't always come naturally to do that. And it's um, something that more and more I'm sort of training myself to do to kind of pull back from um, things that may seem to be really difficult. But a client of mine actually said this week, and she, she really found this distinction for herself, that, um, you know, whatever your set of circumstances, there's always somebody that's excelled in those circumstances rather than being held back by them. Um, she used the example of J.K. Rowling, you know, who, who um, is a single parent and, you know, under extreme adversity produced a set of novels that I'm sure will never, ever be forgotten. Um, so, yeah, there's always a way through and a way forward. And because of that, the hard stuff, um, amazing things can happen, um, not necessarily in spite of them. <laughs> nice, nice catch. And so as I'm just getting a sense of your world now and how you, how you create your world, and, and then just to kind of bring it fully up to date, you've gone from this model in, in, in the therapeutic world where you, you're charged by the hour, you usually do 50 minute hours, there's, there's a pretty much a cap on how much you can charge, and you've moved into a world of coaching where now you charge $100,000 for a year of coaching, right? Yeah, yeah, um, and and like I said, it's it's a lovely way of working because it stops it being this um, like unsupported model and takes it right through to a really supported relationship that can be created. Um, and 
you know, when, when people work with me, their lives change beyond uh, recognition. You know, it's amazing if my clients show up, which um, I choose to work with people who are who fall into that bracket. Um, then, yeah, incredible things happen. And, um, and it's been a really great way to take my practice. I've really enjoyed um, steering it so that I can create those relationships with my clients. It's funny, in the background I have the slides running and they, they were put together at random just some quotes from the book, The Prosperous Coach. The one that just showed up says, your clients are paying for their dreams and their dreams are priceless. Oh, and it's I one love of the things, that. Yeah, it's one of the things I noticed. People say, well, how can you charge it? hundred thousand dollars how would so why would somebody pay that because they're not paying for coaching and they're not even paying for you now something underneath that has to be you know it has to be great coaching that you do and there has to be something powerful about how you show up it's not just asking for any number but assuming that you've done the work that you are powerful as a coach and how you show up in your own world is, is extraordinary then they're not paying for any of those things. Your job is to dive down and uncover their secret dream. The dream they've often never said to a living soul, another living soul. When you bring that out, then that's what they choose to invest in. And if they get a sense that having conversations with you brings that closer, it's a no-brainer. And the numbers are relevant. That's been my experience. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree with that. And the thing for me that makes that so real is that when I look at my own personal transformation and if I really sit and kind of really acknowledge the journey that I have personally come on, you know, if I think about, you know, if I were to put a figure on that, you know, which is impossible, obviously, but, you know, if I were to try and put a figure of appreciation on that, let's say, um, you know, it, it goes absolutely stratospheric. There's almost not a number that can cover it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I love that people can have access to their dreams. And I love that I, I have the tools to be able to guide them towards that and to be able to let go of all of the stuff that maybe held them back from achieving those things. Um, it's, uh, it's all, it, yeah, it's powerful. Cool, which brings us nicely to the word dreams, and let, let's, let's dive into some of yours. Uh, I'm going to give a bit of context just to what we've just done. Uh, I, I, I know you. You've been in my world for a while. Uh, I, I've coached you. You're in my community of uh, the 4PC, the 4% Club, uh, which is a group of 40 of the top 4% of coaches out there. And so we know each other. But still, just a space to dive in and, and have a conversation allows us both to relax allows me to get more of a sense of your work. So I have some context about where we might be going next. And, and now, if you're up for it, are you ready to play? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so if this conversation we're about to have, Kirsty, turned out to be a life-changing conversation, and the people who know me are ready for that question, but the what I hear most often is that I knew you were going to ask that question, but somehow I can never quite prepare for it the same way as when it shows up. But if you and I were going to have a conversation right now, and it turned out to be life-changing, and you called me in a year's time and said, actually, you weren't kidding, Rich. Like, you've asked me that before, but this time, it was even more impactful than it's ever been. Because in the year that's gone, this is what I've created. This is how I've shown up. This is what's changed. What would you be telling me on that phone call, Kirsty? <laughs> oh, I do hate this question. Um, so, oh, yeah. So I don't know where I want to be, but there's some things that have happened recently that has, have really shifted my perspective about what's possible. And, um, and, you know, every time, I, um, every time I'm coached and every time I kind of do this big, uh, kind of dive into the big dream things, um, the, the crazy thing is that they really, they do happen and way quicker than you ever can imagine, you know? Um, so, well, so not can quick, I give you a... quicker than I can imagine, Kirsty, because I... I see... <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, you got me there, touche. <laughs> um, so can I tell you what has happened over the past week? Um, 
and just to give you some context. Yeah, absolutely. Aren't directly answering your question, but so um, so a while ago, in fact, I remember it was in at the beginning of the year. Um, I think I sat in our um, four PC group and I talked about how I wanted to create a different experience for myself and my children. That I absolutely love London, um, but I really want to be connected to nature, and I really want to. Um, kind of just give my children a different experience of life and one of my biggest dreams has always been to um, do this transformational work that I do with people but in beautiful beautiful locations so that that amazing thing that people have when they go on holiday and you know you kind of get out of your life and, and you dream differently because you're on holiday and you're out of your life and it's amazing and then what people do generally is they go back into their life um, exactly as they were before, right? But, but my dream has always been to take people in those amazing spaces, in those amazing locations, and to really do some deep transformational work so that when they go back, um, they take so much more change with them. And when I said that, I remember thinking that it was completely impossible um, because I'm a single mom and my children's father is here and they have a great relationship with him and um, I had a, a huge amount of stories about why that could never ever happen um, anyway so it looks like it's gonna happen <laughs> um, and um, so I've, I've it looks like I'm, I'm being able to arrange to go and live in Bali for six months um, at, from the start of next year um, and I'm really excited about that it looks like some of that dream is kind of coming to fruition and I'm taking it really gently and really slowly and I don't want to make big big leaps but six months is is good for me that seems way more than I could have hoped for before um, so here's what I heard really... can I catch what I heard yeah yeah you had a dream. There was something that looked impossible. Mm -hmm. And within a few months, what looked impossible has become not only possible, but likely, probable. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, um, yeah, it's the big dream thing, right? We think it's impossible if we really dream big enough, and it, you know, it happens. <laughs> There's the news flash to everyone out there, but um, it's really hard to dream big enough so that you get an impossible dream. Um, but, so... so let me just capture that. I want, I want to reflect those words back to you for a second. It's yeah. really hard dream, to dream big enough that, that you have an impossible dream. Like, like even the impossible dreams become possible. And, and for you, that happens on a regular basis, right? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. I remember, yeah, uh, yeah, in all kinds of ways. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it happens for everyone if they let it. I don't... Uh, stay with you for a second. You're not, you're not here to be yeah. a coach right now. Stay with you in your world. Because as much as we can yeah. see it for other people, right, we can help other people with this. But then we come in, into our own world, right, it's, and, and we have yeah. our own, face our own challenges. Yeah. So let so, me bring you back to my question. Or, or there was another piece you wanted to say first. Yeah, I was just going to say, here's the thing, right, so, so that felt so impossible and so blocked and, I mean, I'm still not there, I still have to get permission from my children's school, we'll see what happens, but, um, but for a long time it felt like that was completely impossible, then all of a sudden it just opened up, it was like a switch just flicked and, oh look, here we are, I'm creating this. Um, and then I kind of went into a really strange um, headspace with it. I started to feel, he would talk about the fear, I started to feel fear. And I wasn't quite sure why, because I'm so excited about this. There is nothing, I mean, there are lots of things that if I really dive into them, like seem fearful, like going by myself with two children to a country that I've never been to before, but that doesn't really bother me, that's not really the thing. What the fear was about was something that you spoke about earlier, and as you said it earlier, it really resonated with me, um, about forging the way, like being the first one to go out and do that, doing the thing that 
to everybody else looks difficult, but then they don't do it. So being the first one again to to do the thing and kind of being a bit of a loner with it, or at least that's what it potentially feels like it might become. Um, so that's the thing. But it was really interesting to me how I went from this total excitement to a little bit of, you know, shutdown when, when I realized actually, oh, that, that really big dream, I can actually do that. There's some, there was a piece to that that was very interesting to me. I see a lot in high performance, I, and I see it for myself too, that we create something amazing, and, but then it's like, well, who am I going to tell this to? The, the people around me, I, I notice when, when we share something extraordinary we've done, it can sometimes challenge people. If you, if you can go off and live in Bali for six months, that means I can too, but I've got all these beliefs about, no, well, the school won't let me, and uh, I couldn't do it for this reason, and that reason, and this reason, and so if you do it, my, my mind is challenged. I'd rather say, well, that's because there's something unusual about you, or you're just lucky, or do you, do you realize how dangerous that is? And I'll give you all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. And it's, it is quite hard to tread out on that path. It's like my client said, I'm not lonely, but I feel very alone. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that really, it was when you said that, that that really resonated with me. Um, because I kind of, like I, I kind of flip between two modes, like one being the person who goes out and achieves the things that I achieve and, and then wanting actually to sometimes to, to follow. Like I sometimes want someone to be one step ahead so I can kind of go, oh yeah, that looks, that looks fun. Let's go, let's go there too. Instead of being the one that goes up the mountain first and then waves to people and say, come, you know, the air is great up here. I kind of sometimes want to be the one who's being told that the air is great, just in case the mountain top isn't what it says it's going to be. It's it's sometimes nice to feel held. It's sometimes nice to feel supported. Yeah. Yeah. And so part two of that. So so in answer to your question, um, it's like in in three years' time, looking back at this conversation. I would like to be able to see a really clear path through to continuing um, the adventure and growing my coaching business. Because I have a very, very strong sense that, well, already actually two of my coaching clients are coming up. You know, as soon as I mention Bali, they're like, yeah, yeah, we're coming. We're going to get on the plane. We're going to come and do an intensive with you over that. Um, which is great. And I have a really strong sense that, you know, it would be really nice to yeah, to, to invite people um, into that space to do some work there. But how I navigate that with my children and going forward, I just I, I, it almost feels like at this stage, like I, I, I'm hoping to fly out there in December and I, I don't really want to think about January the 1st because it just is kind of too much. And I, I'd love some help navigating through that. Well, let, let me just come back to what you said. You, you, you want a clear path to continuing the adventure and building your coaching business. My experience with adventures is they're called adventures because there isn't a clear path. <laughs> yeah, you might be right with that. <laughs> and so let me take you to my, back to my question, which is in, in, you know, in a year or, or a couple of years' time you call me, I didn't say what, come back to the present moment and what does it look like going into the future. I said, what is... If you were in the future right now, looking back at the past, if that makes sense. I've taken you a year down the road and you're looking back. You see, that for me is the only path I've ever seen. I live a life of adventure. It's the life I've always lived. I've traveled, lived in lots of different countries and had lots of experiences that have been adventures. I can only give the path at the end. In fact, you've been at a number of my intensives now. People sometimes say to me, well, what's the curriculum? What, what's, what's on the agenda for the event that you're running? It's a four-day event. What's going to happen? In the, you know, and I'll say, I don't know. Ask me at the end, and then I'll tell you what the agenda has been. Because even in an event, I don't know. The agenda's in the room. The agenda's in the audience. So do you, do, have you ever needed a clear path to get to where you've gone to in an adventure and building your business until now? No. I've never had a clear path in anything that I've done, come to think of it. No, not at all. No. I suppose, you know, so, so, that, so the headspace that I got into was um, all about 
but if I don't have a clear path, then uh, there could be all kinds of things that, you know, like I sort of felt like with it's okay for the little things like creating a really successful business. But yeah, when it comes to taking my children to a different, when the big stuff comes, that's when I need a clear path. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. But of course I don't. Yeah, isn't it interesting? We have, there are some areas where we can see that there's space, but there are some areas like, well, no, but these are my kids. No, no, you don't understand. This one's different. Yeah, yeah. yeah I love those ones because those ones are the ones that make me feel the most blind. Like, you know, like I can, yeah, it, you know, those, those, that you get into a fixed mindset. Like in, in most areas of my life, I'm pretty good at seeing my stuff, you know, I, I'm really good at, like, even if I'm in it, I still know that I'm in it. And then there's the ones that I just don't know. And that's, that's really great. And that's why, you know, that's why it's important as a coach to have a coach or as a therapist to have a therapist because, um, yeah, to have, you have your ass kicked out of the stories regularly is super important for me specifically. Um, if you're listening from the US, she means have your ass kicked. <laughs> that too. So let's, let's pause. I want to pause for a moment. I'm going to ask Kiva if she's got any questions, either for... Actually, we won't pause. We'll carry on for a minute. But Kiva, if people have got questions either for me or for Kirsty about coaching or being coached, about coaching high performers or being a high performer getting coached, perhaps we can get some of those questions. In a couple of minutes, I'll come to you and see what we've got on the questions, and we'll pause. Um, and then, Kirsty, we'll carry on for a few minutes, and, and then we'll, uh, Kiva will, will tell us all our questions. Yeah, sure. So... If that wasn't what you needed, right? If, if you know, I'll go back to my first question right at the beginning. If this was an extraordinary conversation today, a life-changing conversation, and you call me in a year's time and you say, wow, you weren't kidding, Rich, it really was life-changing. Initially I said, well, what I'd want is a clear path to continuing the adventure and building my coaching business, and then you reminded me I've never needed one before, so maybe I didn't need one now. What did you say next? Or what did you create in the year that's just passed that made that coaching session amazing a year ago? What I created was a way to really live how I believe it's possible to live for me. Um, and to work in the way that I really believe it's possible to work without being held back by what I perceive as other people's expectations of me. Mm. Because it turns out a lot of the time their expectations of me are either uh, a perception that I have that's not true or it's their stuff and I can't do anything about that. And again, let me check in with you, because we could go there, but my sense is, having said that out loud, that the answer's in the question, right? I'll reflect it back to you so you hear it. You, you, what would make this great is if you get a way to really live and work how you believe it's possible to live and work without being held back by others' expectations. Mm. And, and I'm tempted to dive in, but my sense is the answer's in the question. You get it. Yeah, yeah. You know, the thing that I'm really, really interested in, in is the inspiring lives. You know, it's, it's feeling inspired and inspiring others. That's the thing that really, really gets me fired. And I don't know where we're going with this necessarily, but the, the piece for me is I want to live all the, not all the time, it's not possible to live all the time, but, you know, I want to live in a space of feeling inspired and connecting to others far more deeply than I 
do in a city environment which is so much filled with noise and and I don't mean audio noise but you know just stuff around um, and I really really crave to work with people on a deeper level really on that level of inspiring and inspired of inspiration that can come when you're really in nature and and I don't know how to I don't know how to create that like, and I know I don't need to know the path but I, I just need to let go of the fear and there is fear there about what it means to live in that zone Is that true, Kirsty? Do, do you need to let go of the fear? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. I know that, no, we do not need to let go of the fear, right? That's the thing. That's what I know so deeply, is I can feel that fear, and I can use that to spur me on. Um, well, I don't, use it to spur you on? Uh, you know, it's a bit like, feel the fear and do it anyway. It's a little bit... No, I don't, that's, that's a wrong choice of words. I know what you mean. It. Yeah. It's not to spur me on. It's like it's almost because like this is this is this is something that I really don't like about where I go. It's that it's almost because of the fear. It means I'm gonna do it. It's like that's how I get into that space. It's like it's not feel the fear and do it anyway. It's like the fear means that it's important to me. And there's a lot of emotion. Like I'm, I'm really aware of the. You know, it's funny. I, I, I'm a crier, as you know. I cry at very easily at <laughs> everything. And when I came onto this call, I was thinking, yeah, I'm not gonna. I don't need to go there right now. But you know, I'm feeling the emotion of that. You know, it's this. It's, it's the. It's connecting. So let go of words for a second, and allow yourself to feel what you're actually feeling. And it's okay. I'm okay with tears, and for me they're just a release of emotion. And and allow yourself to feel what you're really feeling, because there's a temptation sometimes to want to talk a lot and, and not let ourselves feel it. And we're both British, and it's a little bit harder for us too. But let let's just drop in. What what's the sensation that's going on in your body right now, Kirsty? I have a tightness in my stomach. I mean, mm. a tightness. and scan your body, what else are you aware of? And a tingling in my hands and my feet that's a little bit like excitement. But, and don't, don't um, want trying to put labels on it right now, just a tingling in your, yeah, your hands. Yeah, tingling and, and the tightness in my stomach, it, the sensation rises up to my throat and it feels tight, constricted in my throat. Mm. And then there's a hotness behind my eyes. Yeah. What, what are you not saying? What have you not said out loud? That I feel like doing this for me is, and for my children, is like there's a need that's like a survival need that's there. It's like I feel so powerfully that it does, f I don't really like working with needs, but it feels like a need. It feels like I want to be somewhere else from where I am. I want to feel connected to nature. I want to slow down. I want to, I want my children to connect with their souls. You know, I want to go to, I want them and me to experience the other that is possible. And it's very easy in a, in a city, particularly I've lived in London my whole life, to feel like that's the only way. And, you know, other people will say, yeah, but the culture's great and, you know, and everything's so wonderful about living here. There's so much on offer for them. And it's like, yeah, there is. But that's not where my values lie. And so say I more about the survival it. need. What does that mean? I felt the emotion behind that, that phrase. It feels like it feels like it 
it feels so so what I'm what I think that I do in the city is I sort of contort to fit the shape of what I need to be in order to do life in the city I don't know if that makes any sense but um, like I feel like a, um, the, the round peg in a square hole kind of situation but you know there's certain things that are required like you know living quite fast and uh, you know kind of scheduling in a you know my children at their school you know everyone comes out of school and then they go into tons of classes afterwards and there's things happening all the time and you know they have the most amazing social lives and I don't necessarily think that's for my children for me the right way at the moment and that's not to say that those things aren't wonderful in their own right to a certain extent but for I just I feel that I'm in a space in my life right now where I want to experience um, nature slowing down feeling connected I want to create space for my children and I just to be together we've had you know a couple of years of turmoil with everything that's been going on and I want uh, and when I'm in that space which I do tap into you know and, and it's not impossible to do it in the city you know it's completely possible but it's just harder I feel like it takes more energy and but when I'm in that space that's when I feel like I have way more to give to my clients and I can, you know, I, I get into a different space myself that allows me to give in a whole different energetic kind of way to the way that, um, that I kind of slip into very easily in this life, in this circumstance. So that's kind of what I meant by survival, but it's just basically, it just feel like, like feet on the ground. Like I'm, I, I hate wearing shoes, you know, most people don't actually realise that about me, apart from the fact that I'll wear flip-flops in freezing cold if possible, but um, but I really don't, I like to feel connected to the earth, you know, I like to walk on the sand, I like to be on a beach, I like to be in a forest, I like to be in nature, um, that's where I feel most at home, and I see that, you know, with my children and with people generally, you know, they come alive in that environment, and I really want to to be more in that space. Here's what I want to do. I want to pause for a moment. Sometimes, if we were, if we were coaching together without an audience, I'd just create some space. I might even give it, given us a break right now. Sometimes it's what I call a hot seat moment. The art of coaching is knowing when to stop talking, when to take a client off the hot seat. And I want to leave you with that sensation of everything you just brought out into the world. You spoke it out loud, and it means so much to you. And we're going to pause. I'm going to see what questions there are and, and let you just sit with what, you, what, what you've just created into the world. And then we'll come back in a few minutes, um, depending on how many questions there are, and we'll see where we go from there, Kirsty. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. Cool. Mm. Hi, Kiva. Hi. So there are many questions. We could be here for days. Um, <laughs> I'll do my best to find the ones that are the most encompassing. I also want to share with you both. There's just so much gratitude and appreciation for this witnessing so um, thank, thank you. you yeah so uh, this question is from Jill Van Node it's actually for either of you um, as high performers do you feel that everyone's big dreams have to be really big meaning what if my big dream is to have a moderate coaching practice with plenty of time for me to explore other passions time with my husband traveling doing Feldenkrais practicing my art and enjoying nature I feel this is enough but I do wonder, is there a bigger dream? Am I playing small, even though I'm happy and satisfied? What question would you ask this satisfied, smaller dreamer? Hmm. Ooh, nice. That just helped me relax into my seat. You know, sometimes the challenge of being a high performer is you're driven from a place that isn't healthy. Uh, I, I gave a talk recently um, called I Don't Need Help. Um, I, I've I've been driven from this place of trying to prove myself to my dad for most of my life. It turns out that I never needed to, it, and but it's what drove me. I didn't think he was proud of me. Everything I did was for another purpose, and and I don't need help. Was just I can do it on my own. I've got to show you guys how I can do anything. I don't need anyone to help me or support me. So I hear that question, I just relax and I breathe, and it's like, oh, this is cool. No, I think it's really nice to know exactly what you want. 
And if at some point there's something more that you you feel called to do, then then you'll go for that too. So being a high performer, or for me coaching high performers, it's just it just happens to be where I like my coaching practice to be aimed. It's because I know from the inside out what it feels to have these challenges that others don't see. Uh, these these high quality problems. I I, I interviewed. Uh, someone who, who was talking to a billionaire the other day, the other day, and this billionaire said, "the the problem with my millionaire friends is they're not dreaming big enough." That for me was fascinating because these millionaires are surrounded by people who always think who think they're the, the the most amazing person in their world, and here's someone else who's saying, "Actually, you guys aren't dreaming big enough." But that isn't the only way to be, and it is really nice to hear a question like that. To know that actually you're creating the life that you love, and the practice that you love, and if there's something more that you want, I've got no doubt when there, when there's time, when it's time, you'll go after it. But not because you need to go for anything bigger or more than you already have. I, I really did relax into myself when I heard that question. So that was a great question, Kiva. Hmm. So there are quite a few questions. Um, I'm going to put them in the magic pill pool, and Kirsty, <laughs> they're for you. Um, lots of people asking, how did you make the leap from hourly to charging 100000 per year? How are you articulating the value? What support did you call in? Um, I'm imagining rich is a big part of that, but I'll let you address that. Mm, so, um, so it is a very interesting alchemy of making that switch. Um, however, I think think a lot of it is wrapped up in um, like those old stories that I would tell myself about oh I can only charge this much because um, so and so is only charging this much and I and I'm going to be compared to them and you know there was some some very definite constraints that I put um, around myself and it was really interesting to me you know I I um I spent a long time um, arming and ahhing about whether or not I could charge, move my fees from ninety-five pounds a session to one hundred and twenty pounds a session. Like that felt impossible to me for a, a while, and then it became like, oh, how can I go up to one hundred and fifty? You know, at, at each point, it felt impossible to me. Um, and really, what uh, the model that I used in my um, in my therapy practice was that I would become full and when, when my practice was completely full I put my prices up and then there'd be a natural drop off and I would continue doing the same. Um, but then when I read The Prosperous Coach, my, the, the switch really flicked for me about um, I can create my practice any way I want to. I'm not comparable to any else and the thing that um, that really changed things for me was um, not comparing myself like on a level of quality you know like am I as good as that person or not as good as that person or you know how to, it's not about that and really switching to, to what we were talking about earlier um, of um, you know a client is paying for their experience and um, and also that I'm not responsible for their experience. So my fee then became about um, it was like how how it was like a number. Like what's the? It's an access fee to me. That's all it is. It's just that's the amount that I've decided that that it costs to work with me because I know I can be really congruent about knowing the power of what I do. And that's just how I choose to set up my practice. And it took a long time for me to mentally make the leap. But basically, the difference is that I just started asking for it in a different way. Um, I just, I got, just, I, I just said the numbers, and I offer my clients options. So you know, some people are very clearly therapy clients and will never be coaching clients. Some people are very, very clearly coaching clients, and that's why they've approached me. And other people kind of bridge the gap, and so I always meet people, and I do um, an assessment, and, and you know, I either meet them face to face if I can, or um, on telephone or Skype, and I just kind of talk with them and really slow things down, really, really slow things down, and do an assessment of exactly where they're at, what they want to achieve, do they inspire me, does it feel right? I'm very intuitive about the way I work, so you know, intuitively. I kind of get a sense of what's happening there, um, and I just kind of see see if it feels right. Um, so that it's you know it's hard when we dive into the um, 
the what do I actually do, we can kind of pick it apart a bit more. But it's it, it is very much a question of, you know, what are they coming for? What seems right to me? And if I want to spend time with them and create that coaching relationship, and obviously if they want to do the same with me, then we can kind of get creative about how that works. Let me just draw out a couple of distinctions in there, Kirsty. So you, you talked about, you asked the question, do they inspire me? That, for me, is the most fun part about building a coaching practice. When you begin to look for clients who inspire you instead of looking for clients who you can inspire, that's a game changer. When you said you get that they're paying for their experience and I'm not responsible for that experience, that takes you to a being a high-level coach. See, most clients don't get this. They don't want you to go on the ride with them. They think they do. Most coaches think, well, my job is to be responsible, so if, if you're getting your goals and achieving your goals, then I can feel great, and if you're not getting them, I feel bad and I'm responsible. That isn't your job. They don't want you as a great coach to be feeling great when they do and feeling sad when they do. Your job is to actually be the person who believes in them no matter what, knowing that we all have challenges. We, oh, look, here's the slides in front of me, right? It says, safety is the enemy of success. Be proud of your mistakes, take a risk, fail spectacularly, and then go out and fail more. Well, that's our job, to hold that space for our clients. It's okay for you to fail as we work together. I'm here for you. I'm with you. You're going to have successes, you're going to have challenges, and I'm going to be here with you, alongside you, along, as, as both of them show up, not attached. Uh, coaches sometimes are amused when they hear me say this. I'm going to be less attached to your goals than you are. And, and it's strange, but, but really they're going to pay you all that money and you're going to be less? Yeah, absolutely. They don't want me and don't need me being attached to their goals. That's not what I'm here for. There's, there's so much more both of us could say on this one, uh, Kiva. Uh, th there's, let me just give a little story. At my last intensive, I no a year and a half ago at an intensive for coaches, I gave them all a challenge over a lunch break to go out and make bold proposals. But here's the context I gave them. Go out and collect no's, go out and make mistakes, go out and fail, and come back and we'll celebrate the no's you collected, the mistakes you made, and how you failed. In the last event I held for 4PC, the 4% the, the club for extraordinary coaches, one of the participants said, I was at that event 18 months ago, and I hated you when you gave me that challenge. I, I wanted to leave. I didn't want to come back. I, I, I made up all these excuses. I was ready to say why I couldn't you know, ask anyone, make any proposals. And with 30 minutes to go, I just said, oh, my God, I'm going to do it. He has an animal sanctuary, and he made three phone calls. Each of them was to ask for a million-dollar donation for his animal sanctuary. He got two no's from the people who picked up. The third person he left a voicemail for, they never called him back, ever. He failed, made no money. A couple of months ago when he shared what had happened in the 18 months since, he's raised $2.2 million for his animal sanctuary because he said, in that exercise, I lost my fear of the word no, and I learned... I can ask for a million dollars just as easy as I can ask for $10. So I'm going to keep asking for a million dollars. And it's one of the things that Kirsty said a moment ago, practicing that new number so it rolls off your tongue like your phone number really shifts things. And not being attached to getting a yes, actually seeking the no's. We say in the book, yes lives in the land of no. Mm, thank you for sharing that story, Rich. That was beautiful. Um, I think I'm going to let you guys go on. Uh, there's a lot of requests to, to drop back in, mm -hmm. and then we can come back to questions at the end. How would that be? Yeah, let's play some more. Mm -hmm. Kirsty, I had a client a few years ago who, um, an amazing woman, she uh, came back from, she was a, a consultant in the corporate world, and she came back from a holiday in the Maldives, and she said, Rich, it was amazing. We had a private chef, the, uh, the, the hotel upgraded us to the presidential suite, the service was extraordinary, it was amazing, and she was really depressed about going back to London. 
So I said to him, hang on a second, and, you know, my experience of going to nice hotels is that even in nice hotels there are people who are enjoying the experience and people who are really miserable. And she said, oh yeah, yeah, that was like that where we were. And I said, well, well how, how, did you create, how did you get the presidential suite? And she said, well, you know what, actually, we were there about 10 years ago. I've only been there once before, the same hotel, but we wrote handwritten letters to everyone who'd been with it, helping us at that hotel in the, in the couple of weeks we stayed there because we were so moved and touched by how just beautiful their service was. And they remembered us 10 years later. And that's why they upgraded us to the presidential suite. She said, we sat down for dinner the first night and the chef was there and he does, he's, you know, does private cooking for, for people in you know, the private villas there. We just sat down with him. He was, he was by, by our table and we started talking to him. And we were so interested in him. We put so much attention on him. And we were so engaged by what he had to say that he really loved that. And he offered, I would like to be your personal chef while you're here. And she began to see that it wasn't about being in the Maldives that made that experience incredible. And we created a distinction for her called the Maldives in London. That she could create that experience wherever she went in the world. And having created that distinction, I remember the next day she called me and she said, you know what, I was in Starbucks this afternoon. And I just did what I did with that chef. I put my attention on the person serving me coffee. I was so interested in them and so engaged by them and I was just curious about their world that they said, sit down, we'll bring your coffee to you. And it was such a tiny thing but she saw that it was how she shows up that allows her to create an extraordinary world wherever she goes and it just looked like the Maldives were what was creating it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love I love that. And it's funny that you talk about that because this week um something really clicked for me and I started creating Bali in London. I did exactly that. And um, you know, I, I do try hard to um actually I don't try hard. It comes naturally to me to um to kind of operate in a different way, I guess, to um, a lot of city folk in that I do try and slow down and notice the things that I, you know, that a lot of people pass by and um, interact with people and connect with people. Like I will often talk to people on the tube, which is unheard of in London, but I do it because it feels like that's a nice thing to do, you know. And so, um, so yeah, you know, I, I really get that thing of, you know, you take yourself with you wherever you go, right? And that's an important one to remember. I had it the other way around for a few years. You know, I've, I'm from London, but I, I like going there as a tourist. I don't like living there. And my father was ill, seriously ill, the last couple of years. And, and also Monique, my wife, wanted to go and live in London. She's from uh, LA and wanted to experience living in London. And my initial instinct was to say to her, no, I can't go there. I don't thrive in London. I've lived in Africa. I've lived in Southeast Asia. I've lived all over the planet. I just I don't thrive in London. I don't want to be there. And then, of course, being in the field that I'm in, I began to reflect on that for a while. And I realized, well, what if that's just a story I've made up? And who I'm being over here, I think, is about being over in L.A. that makes life amazing. It's like nothing to do. It's just who I am and how I show up. And I could be anywhere in the world. And I let go of that fear about moving back to London. It turns out we haven't gone back yet, but the fear isn't there any longer. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I will keep her flat in London. <laughs> I'm not going to get rid of, you know, I'm not intending to sort of uproot um, permanently. But it's more about experience. It's just that it's about experiences, you know. Like part of my passion is collecting together experiences, and um, it's another experience. Um, so I've yeah, and, us back and to the thing is, that I just want to share what I brought us back to this slide. Um, I don't know if you can see the screen, but oh I yeah, I love this. Yeah, I use this with my clients all the time. You know, I often use the metaphor of a train. You know, it's like you're. You're on a train and you're traveling down a track and the, the track is like um, a default path that you take like in spite of your 
fears uh, because of your fears and because of your you know your limiting beliefs and the stories you tell yourself and all that stuff that keeps you fixed and yet we have the opportunity to have to steer a creative path you know we can we can stop we can look out the window we can check the destination you know we can have a word with the driver we can be the driver you know and i i love that because it is all about it's about choices that's the thing that's so important to me is it's about the choices that we can make um, and we always have a choice thanks it's a, it's a great diagram to use with clients so I, I wouldn't put why they pay you on it but the distinction between <laughs> a default future and a created future it, absolutely people living into a default future you take where they were five years ago where they are now you can extrapolate into the future where they're going to be a, a couple of degrees above the horizon from now or and I, and I drew this carefully this is an exponential curve going up a created future now the thing is if you look at an exponential curve for you know the first third of that curve it's so similar to the default future it's really hard to differentiate those lines at the beginning are really close and it's hard to tell and they begin to differ ever so slightly but in an exponential world things happen really rapidly and you shared at the beginning of the conversation right just in the last week something just shifted in you and and, and then there was a moment a year ago when you, you were invited to be on a, on a stage to give a TED talk and that didn't look possible you know a week a month a year before that created futures are so powerful that's all I'm ever doing in a conversation like this is helping somebody to create their future and, and let me just I'll, I'll say people who are listening it's the very reason I asked the question or a version of it at the start of a call I, I asked people something like this uh, you know if if you were to call me in a year's time and say that our conversation a year ago was extraordinary what what would you have created in the last year and, and the reason I do that is because they go into that future in that moment they have to they're creating it in that very moment when they answer the question and there is no such thing as the future we only ever have the present moment so for me a goal is not a place to get to it's a place to come from all I'm ever doing in a conversation like this is reminding you of the place to come from not the place to get to can I add something um, that just occurred to me when I'm looking at this diagram I'm sort of referring to the question that came earlier about therapy into coaching and but also into session by session coaching session by session anything but the thing with the exponential curve is that if you're just working with people um, on a session by session basis or a very short term basis the tendency is for people to hop off before they get into that sense that feeling of a created future um, and by working with people on a longer over a longer period of time you get to really like, um, work with them on that journey of when the curve starts to rise and that's where the magic happens it's like it's that little moment where it lifts away from the default path that's nice. great catch the other challenge of course working short term or paying by the hour is a distinction I call serving versus pleasing to be a powerful coach you come from this place of I'm here to serve you not to please you but if you're paying me hourly and I don't know if you're going to come next week or not until you pay the next week's fee then I'm going to please you I'm going to say the things I think you need to hear think you want to hear rather than what you need to hear and that comes back to where we were where are we Oops. here your client has a default future that will occur on his own his life does not change when he pays you he's paying for his life to change and he's paying you to hide nothing, hold nothing back, challenge him to be the person he already is. That's the distinction that's important to me, Kirsty. I know who you are. I've known who you are from the moment I met you, and I have this unwavering belief in who you are. It doesn't matter what questions you throw at me, what doubts you bring into the room, I know who you are. Yeah, and that's a, such a powerful thing to feel as you're being coached and also as a coach you know I always think that that's my superpower if I have a superpower it's that I can sit in front of another human being and I know in every single cell in my body that they can have an incredible experience of life and when you feel that 
you know, which I do when I'm being coached by you, that, um, you know, it, it, something shifts really deeply, I think. So where should we go now? I don't know. What would make the conversation even more powerful than where it's gone so far? I feel like um, I feel like I have the belief and I have the knowledge and I you know a lot of being able to do this for me is about um, continuing to engage with clients and potential clients um, on the level that I do and knowing that when I, when I slightly shake up my world that that will still be possible. And I know that that will still be possible but I don't feel it 100%. I sort of feel like there's a bit of either or going on. And, and can you just make that real for me? Am I right? You think that if you go and live in Bali, you might keep having the clients you have already? Yeah, I don't know. I sort of feel like if I'm, there's a, I'm I've always been split between, um, or felt the split between being a great mother and creating life as I would like it to be and you know the business head and and you know i want to bring the two worlds together that's what i really want to do i want to really yeah i want to be able to do both and to really know how i can integrate that um i'm seeing that slide slow down to speed up and um that's my journey how to slow down enough so that I can continue having the conversations with those people, the inspiring people that I want to work with, um, totally kind of shift my location and life around and be a great mum in all of that as well. Um, and I don't know, we're going to find the answers in the next five minutes, but you know, I think there's something in that slowing down to speed up um, thing. I work with a lot of powerful women and I work with a lot of powerful women coaches, so you're not alone. And here's the thing, Marcus Buckingham wrote a book called A Strongest Life for Women. And in that book he said, they researched mothers. He used to work for Gallup. They did some research and asked hundreds or thousands of mothers if they thought their kids would want more time with them. And every mother said yes. They asked their kids, the, same, the kids of those mothers, if they want more time with their mothers. And none of the kids said they want more time with their mothers. They said they want more quality time. And it's about creating quality experiences with our children. It's not the amount of time that we need to create with them. That's how I found when I slow down around creating time with my family. This week I'm, I'm stopping every day at 3 p.m. because I'm taking Kaleo and my eldest, my three-year-old, to, uh, to swim class. I had to wipe a bunch of things off my calendar and it feels edgy for me to do that. But I have got three values in life, fun, freedom, and family. And I'm willing to compromise on my business and on the money I make to make those values be higher. So it's, it's not in my, it's, so you're not alone. Um, I, I, I've, I've met women coaches who have coached from inside a closet because it was the only space in their house where they could get silence enough to coach a client on the phone while the kids were in the room next door. I've met women coaches who've coached inside the bathroom to get space in order to coach a client. And my, the way I see the way that you're creating your world right now 
is the way I've chosen to create mine with a few high performing, high paying clients comes for me a lot of freedom, a lot of space. It's not that it's any better. I don't want to put that up as an example that every coach should aim to have high paying clients. It's not the path for everybody. But it, it's a path for me to give me the freedom and the space that I want and I choose for my life. And, and that diagram, Kirsty, slow down to speed up, is so powerful for me. I'm, I'm listening to a book, an audio book right now called Essentialism by Greg McCowan. And he says, less but better. Less but better. And it's such a powerful way to live life. Less clients, less events, less things, less experiences, but every one of them is better. Kirsty, I see you're muted right now. Just unmute yourself. I can't. Oh, someone did it for me. I couldn't unmute. Um, yes, yes, less is better. I love that. I've just written that down in big letters because um, that's um, less but better is the, is, is the way forward, you know, and that's exactly it. And that's, that's what I've been doing over the recent times is really kind of stripping back scaling back the, the the things that the sand is what I call it, you know, the stuff that's not the essentials, the stuff that's not the core, um, and really kind of getting to to the quality, I guess, of what it is. Mm. And that's that's exciting. Actually, it's really you know, i I feel like my the, the energy of my voice has dropped, but actually um, it's really grounding and really exciting to be in that space and I've actually made a decision to drop a lot of my therapy well not drop when I finish up with the therapy clients that I'm seeing currently and not take on any more at the moment because I want to be able to give the few people that I work with and, and not everybody's at that you know that high fee you know I work with people you know on different scales but I want to be able to give every single one of those people really really great levels of attention better you know I want to really go into that better so um, yeah I'm gonna write that up and stick it on my wall hmm. <laughs> I think I think Kiva muted you because there was an echo in the background so maybe carry on with that Kiva but I'll respond and then we'll yeah, see we're getting quite a bit of uh, feedback perfect Kirsty if you can actually manage it on your end if when you're not speaking you can mute yourself I will absolutely yeah thank you so again, I, I, we threw these slides together at random, just quotes from the book, I didn't know what order they'd be in, um, but, but here's the final slide. Life really can be exponential. You are far closer to everything you want than you could ever imagine. Miracles are far closer than you think. Um, it's, that's a way I choose to see life. Is it true? I don't know, it's true because <laughs> I choose for it to be true. I choose to see the, life, the, the world is that way. I'm teaching my boys to see life that way. Because if you show up from that way and that's your belief about life, it's going to become your world. And, and it, here's what I heard just now, Kirsty. You, you, you caught that you were kind of grounded, your voice had dropped, and then you realized you were excited at the same time. Um, I love that because excitement without grounding means you float off into the atmosphere, right? Excitement with grounding there's this place in the middle where I, I'm, I'm standing right now and I'm, I'm moving my hands like one hand's moving up and the other hand's moving down. There's this excitement, this energy that's moving between both of my hands, one above the other, the excitement and the grounding. For me, what I say when I'm asked what's coming next in my life, I say I don't know, but I, I do have a compass. I don't have a map, but I do have a compass. And for me, the compass is a little bit of excitement on this side, and a little bit of fear on the other side. Not too much excitement that, that I, I, I get carried away, not too much fear that I get blown out, but a little bit of each because there's this fine line down the center, and that's the path I tread. Just on the that was... Yeah, sorry, <laughs> playing with the meat one. Um, yeah, yeah, excitement versus fear. And that's exactly 
um, where I'm at with this at the moment, I think, is like uh, there's a most of the time a larger percentage of me f sits on the excitement side and then sometimes I kind of get pulled over to fear and then it's about finding a balance in the middle. Um, and yeah, I guess the balance in the middle is kind of like the flow state. You know, if, you, if you've got the perfect tension between the two, then you can exist in a state of flow and that kind of carries you through. Um, so I'm playing with that. <laughs> I could probably play with that more than I do. It's funny you say flow. One of the reasons you know this, one of the reasons I, I, I call this group of coaches I'm, I'm leading the 4% club, it's not just that they're the 4% of top 4% of coaches. In Stephen Kotler's book, The Rise of Superman, he studied high performing athletes, the kind of athletes who jump off a rock face in a wingsuit, the kind of athletes where it's life or death. And being in flow, is what allows them to perform at a very high level. The thing about being in flow is, if you try and improve yourself the way most of us feel, like I should be, you know, even Reid Hoffman, where I began the call, even Reid Hoffman, this billionaire making a big impact on the planet, thinks he's got 40% more energy and focus to give. We go too far. What he discovered in this book is that a 4% shift in the way of doing things, the way of seeing our world, the way of our thinking, a 4% shift is enough as a high performer to change everything. For most people, that 4% is actually too high. For high, for high performers, they go far beyond it. I know in any kind of conversation like this with a high performer, I'm not looking for some big breakthrough. It's the tiniest of moments, a single distinction, one new way of seeing their world and their entire world shifts. 4%. It's a very tiny shift. And my sense is that, that you feel it right now, Kirsty, whatever it's been for you. You don't have to put it into words right now. I'm not asking to articulate it, but my sense is it's a felt shift. It's visceral. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's like, for me, that shift is like... Um, it's like the two, the metaphor of the two ships that set sail on what looks like a completely identical course. And then it turns out there's a tiny, tiny difference in the course of one of them. And before you know it, um, the two ships can't even see each other across the sea. You know, and for me, it, yeah, there's, there's been a It's the default future shift. and the creative future, right? That yeah. tiny, tiny difference at the beginning leads in huge, hugely different directions. Yeah. Yeah, and it is exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah. Kirsty, thank you for trusting me. Thank you for trusting me, particularly when we had an audience today. You were willing to really dive in, that you allow, allowed your emotions to play out when you, when you felt them. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for inviting me. For most of human history, it wasn't called coaching. It was called leadership. And it's what I love to do to coach people, to lead people, and to mess with people's thinking. If you'd like more of this, or if you'd like to learn more about our community of extraordinary top performers, go to richlitvin.com forward slash one insight.